praise the name of Jesus. Well, that piece of technology is forever gone, and uh, uh, we bless the Lord. So this morning, uh, Michelle is uh, feeling under the weather, and um, so Nick and I, uh, she has the day off. Please be praying for her. It is not COVID-19 related, praise Jesus, um, but she needed some time to rest, and so uh, this morning, this is why we're uh, kind of pinch hitting for her, Nick and I, and uh we pray that you're blessed. But this morning we're uh, in Matthew chapter 6. We're in week 2. I'm going to kick some things around because I'm going to actually have to move this morning. But uh, we are in week 2 of a four-week series on prayer. Uh, last week we talked about the power of prayer. Uh, we um, specifically addressing the authority that Jesus has given to his family to overcome the challenges in spiritual warfare that the enemy is constantly bombarding us with. You'll wanna hop on the website and watch that message as it's a primer for all of prayer. Now today we're on the topic of provisional prayer. Can you say that with me? The provision of prayer. Not provisional, but the provision of prayer. Prayer that moves the heart of God, releasing the provision he has already prepared for you. Now, God does not have to wait for you to ask. He is God and he knows what we need before we ask. However, he has given his children a key to the kitchen, a key to the provision that he has already prepared for you. Today, we're going to talk about that provision that he has already prepared for you. In Matthew chapter 6, the preamble to the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer that Jesus, how Jesus teaches the disciples to pray, in Matthew 6 verses 5 through 8, Jesus talks about how we are to approach God the Father. That number one, we're to come in humility because he is God. Come in humility. That doesn't mean come in weakness. What it means is come in humility. Come with confidence, not arrogance. Come with humility. Why? Because he's God and we're not. And that's why we're praying is because he's God and we're not. And number two, to come and listen more than we speak. To come and listen more than we seek more than we speak, excuse me. In Matthew 6, Jesus is already preaching the Sermon on the Mount, a message that uh, is intended to change the way that people see the biblical law. Uh, Jesus starts a conversation on prayer that I believe is the underlying subject through Matthew 7, 27. So all the way from the beginning of Matthew chapter 6 through nearly the end of Matthew chapter 7, the underlying, the underlying uh, framework of what Jesus is saying in this section of the Sermon on the Mount is really related to prayer. Well, why is that important to anyone listening today? Because studying the Bible reveals who God is. Prayer is how we know who God is. Studying the Bible reveals who God is. But prayer is is how we know who God is. Studying is how we recognize him, getting into the devotional uh, relationship with the word of God, with the Bible. Studying is how we recognize him, but prayer is how we realize him in our lives. Prayer is how God spans the distance between heaven and earth. Now, all prayer is initiated by the Holy Spirit. I remember the first time that a mentor, uh, Dr. Stewart, said that to me. We were on a trip together and we were praying. And he said, you know, all prayer is, is initiated by the Holy Spirit. And I, it took me days to actually ruminate on that, to actually let it sink in. But here's the premise. All prayer is initiated by the Holy Spirit because all prayer begins with faith. And that is not something we are born with. It's something we are given. A gift that leads to salvation and living a new life in Christ. Jesus makes prayer a priority. And we see times throughout the New Testament where Jesus prayed many times. 
where Jesus prayed. In fact, we see several times that Jesus actually left his disciples and went up into the hills to pray by himself. Jesus knew the Father intimately, but prayer is how he realized the Father's will, the Father's work, and the Father's wisdom on earth. Prayer is how God's will moves from heaven to earth. Prayer is how God's will gets done on earth. Now, look in your Bibles with me at Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Jesus says to the disciples, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive in our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 11, Jesus says this, Give us today our daily bread. The provision of prayer. The model prayer that Jesus uses to teach the disciples how to pray is broken really into two sections. One is recognition. One is recognition and two is requests. One, recognition. Now, because we need to know who we are praying to and how to approach him. Hebrews 4.16 says, Then let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in time of need. We need to recognize who is on the throne. Prayer is not very effective when we are on the throne of our lives. If you have it all under control, then why do you need to pray? Sitting on the throne of your own life, it's, it's all good until the problems of your life become bigger than your throne. Now, one of the goals of salvation by grace is that Jesus sits upon the throne of the believer's life. Because nothing in all creation is bigger than his throne. Because nothing is beyond his power and his authority. Hebrews 1.3 says this, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his power, his powerful word. After he provided purifications for sin, listen to this, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus' throne is at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. He is right in it. He is right in it. There, Hebrews 9, 24 says, Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for God, appear for us in God's presence. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Through prayer, Jesus invites us and gives us access to, to the throne of grace where he is interceding for us. Number one, the model prayer begins with recognition. Number two, requests. The model prayer is broken up into two parts, recognition and request. The second part is request. God knows we have needs in this life. Hebrews 4.15 4, 4, says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to uh, identify with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus invests the remainder of Matthew 6 and Matthew 7 on this subject of our needs. Our need for breakthrough in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Our need for money in verses 19 through 24. Our need for daily peace to overcome worry in 25 through 34. And then in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. He, he goes on in, in chapter seven, talking about our need for soul reform in relationships Verse one being the sole reform we actually really need most is do not judge or you too will be judged. 
our need for help, general help. Most of the time, we need help. Verse 7 of Matthew 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. When you are in a moment where you need help, what are, who is the first person you ask? Do you go to the Lord knowing that he has a response for you? Or do you just grind through the problem, hoping to find a new solution? Our need for an example to follow in verses 9 through 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. This sums up the law and the prophets, Jesus said. Imagine what it would be like in this life if we spent a little bit of time before the Lord asking him to help us treat others the way we want to be treated. What do you think the world would look like if we all treated others the way we wanted to be treated. The respect that you desire, maybe the respect that you give. The love that you desire, maybe the love that you give. To treat others the way you want to be treated. Jesus goes on in verses 13 through 20 to talk about our need for truth and wisdom. And and then in verse 21 through 27, our need for stability and certainty. Jesus knows our needs and that we are prone to worry about what we do not have control over. Is there anybody else who's watching today who would say, yes, I worry about things I don't have control over. But in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says this, therefore, don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So back to the subject of our conversation today. The prayer of provision. Verse 11 of Matthew chapter 6. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Here's maybe another way to say this. Release to us today what you have already prepared for our daily needs. Release to us today what you've already prepared for our daily needs. Now, many Bible teachers believe Jesus is referring in verse 11 back to two spots in the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 16 and Proverbs chapter 30. One is the daily provision of manna in the wilderness in Exodus chapter 16. Now, while the people of Israel are moving through the wilderness of the desert between Egypt and the promised land, they run out of food. They run out of the food that they brought with them. And so God provides food for them. Every morning when they got up, they would would go outside their tents and pick up manna. It was like a seed that looked like dew on the ground. It's kind of funny. The word manna in Hebrew means what is it? Literally, it means, what is it? I mean, people may say, well, it said, no, it means bread of heaven. That's not what it means at all. If you look at the original text, the original Hebrew language, manna means, what is it? Sometimes it's difficult to recognize God's provision because he knows what we need versus what we see we want. And so what does God do? He provides manna on the ground every morning. And they would pick up the seed and prepare bread from it. Now, this is a good example of how God provides. He provided them the base product, but they still had to work to prepare the bread. Preparation and work are very important to God. So every day they would gather the manna they needed for that day. Now, when it came to the Sabbath, the day before the Sabbath, they would gather enough for two days. Because on the Sabbath, they were not to work. The manna would last the two days. If they gathered more than their daily allotment for they and their families, guess what would happen? By the morning of the next day, the manna that they thought that they were going to hold on to, that they were going to store up, it was rotten and not edible. And they had to go back out and gather more for their daily allotment Each day. Now, the provision of manna, 
the seed to prepare the bread required for them to live and be strengthened for that day. God provided what they needed to be strengthened for that day, not for tomorrow, but for today. Now, this is really important connection to Jesus' teaching on prayer. Give us today our daily bread. This is not a request just about food. If it was, Jesus may have just used the term, give us today our daily food. But he uses a specific word, bread. Bread is a word that means more than food. In John 6, 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is the bread of life that meets our deepest needs, the things that we hunger and we thirst for. You see, every day we need more than just food. We need spiritual nourishment to live healthy. Kind of recognizing Captain Crunch is good for breakfast to satisfy physical hunger. But what do I do about worry, about fear, about anxiety or uncertainty? Jesus shows us that prayer every day is how God connects us with the fresh bread that he has already prepared. Matthew 6, 11, once again, give us today our daily bread reveals God's desire to speak with us every day. His desire to meet us every day and provide for more than our immediate physical needs. Maybe some Captain Crunch for the soul. How to live more sweetly and live like, not live so much like a grouch or fearful or anxious or worrying about things that are not ours to carry. What are the things you recognize you need every day? How much better do you think your life would be if you were daily engaged in prayer, listening and allowing God to be your bread of life for today? Let me ask you a question in another way. Would the aroma of your life be different if you were taking fresh bread from the kitchen of heaven every morning instead of settling for the dried leftover crust from yesterday, last week, or the last time you prayed. When it comes to bread, I'm, I'm not picky. When we lived in Las Vegas, I, I used to ride a, a road bike quite a lot. I, I rode to work, I rode to church, I rode to school, I rode to see Belinda pretty much every day, really early in the morning, I would ride past a bakery on West Washington. Those of you who are watching in Las Vegas, you may remember this bakery on West Washington. I think it's actually still there. It's near the freeway. And I would ride past it on my way to the church. And early in the morning, the aroma would absolutely smack me in the face. You've smelled the aroma of fresh baking bread. My mouth would water every morning as I rode past that bakery. Now this is the aroma of God's daily presence in our lives when every morning we wake up hungry for fresh bread from heaven. It takes some effort though, just like the manna of Exodus chapter 16, that though God provided the seed, they still had to prepare the bread. Now prayer takes time. That is the complaint I hear most often. I have no time to pray. At my age, I'm thinking, I don't have the time to not pray more. Prayer is how we partner with God to release heaven's resources on earth. Give us today our daily bread, daily wisdom, daily understanding, daily peace or joy or strength or daily refilling of the Holy Spirit, motivation to keep moving forward, daily healing, daily restoration, daily greater increase of love in my life, both physical 
and emotional mercy. Daily Captain Crunch for the body and for the soul. Now the second reference many Bible teachers believe Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 6 verse 11 is found in Proverbs chapter 30 verses 8 and 9 in the sayings of Agur. Many people believe that all of the Psalms were written by Solomon and, and they're not true. Most of them were, but the last two were not. Proverbs 30 and Proverbs 31. And Proverbs 30 was, was written by Agur and these are called the sayings of Agur. And they're really one, it's really a wonderful chapter on, on practical wisdom. And he says in verse eight of chapter 30 of Proverbs, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Listen to verse nine, listen to the wisdom in this statement. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. Often, I hear when things are going well that people pray less. Well, what do I have? What do I need? How about that becomes a baseline for what God wants to do more of in our life? I find it compelling that Agar begins this phrase about provision with keep falsehood and lies far from me. What does that mean? This is about poverty and riches, right? the falsehood and lies in relationship to money and provision. Number one, falsehood or lie, maybe I don't need help or, or maybe God has more important things to do than to help me. God, give me the dream I want, not the plan you have. Maybe that's one of the lies or more money makes things better. Money helps as long as you don't let money manage you. And finally, well, I want that thing. You know, that thing will help me feel better about myself. We don't actually admit that, but boy, do we spend like that. When we think, well, well I'll just put it on the credit card. Everybody has debt, right? The list of falsehood and lies in relationship to money are endless. Because money doesn't make the world go round. The gravity around the sun does in case you needed some science this morning. Money helps when you keep it in perspective and it doesn't change you. Agar says, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of my God. There are some who preach a gospel of prosperity and some who preach a gospel of poverty. Jesus, however, preaches the gospel of provision. Daily provision, daily bread. As we close this morning, I wanna give you a couple of practical daily exercises that will get you into the kitchen of heaven where the baker has fresh bread prepared for you. Number one, make time daily to read your Bible. Make time daily to read your Bible. I know you've heard this a thousand times if you've heard it once, but make time daily to read your Bible. Have a reading plan that helps you to read through the Bible, to read the Bible daily. Maybe not read it in a year when you're beginning or year after year in the beginning. Maybe not do that. Maybe take a chapter a day. Reading through the Bible is good, but, but what, the actual doing of the reading is better. <laughs> Devotional life is like exercise. Um, it's a discipline. Now, what is the best daily exercise for you? The exercise you will do every day. An exercise plan won't do any good until you do the exercise you actually plan. It's the same thing with your devotional life. Reading the Bible won't, having a Bible reading plan won't do you any good until you actually start reading the Bible. Daily time in the Bible, daily bread is how we recognize God and what he's doing. 
Every day when I read the Bible, I find something I need to take into my day that will help me be better. Maybe create less turmoil through my words. Maybe live a little bit less self-reliant or self-dependent. Now, one of my personal practices, and some of you have actually been part of this with me as we've walked through the book of Proverbs together. One of my personal practices is to read uh, along with the Old Testament and the New Testament, a chapter in the Old Testament and a chapter in the New Testament every, every day is to read a chapter of Proverbs every day. There are 31 chapters in Proverbs. Now, every day there's something practical for me that I discover, that I take into my work, my family, my physical, and my spiritual life. There's fresh bread to fuel a better life for me. Now, I need wisdom. And I, 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 I think I could probably say that for you too, that you need wisdom. And James says that when you need wisdom to ask, believing that you've received, well, that worked for me up to a point. I recognized God wanted to help me be more wise, but I seemed to keep getting in the way almost every day. So I set out in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, to get out of God's way when I ask him for wisdom. Now, it's been a work in progress, but uh, I broke down each chapter into a one word synopsis. It continues to develop as I grow, but let me give you an example. In Proverbs chapter one, the one word synopsis to me for Proverbs chapter one is listen. So the first day of every month, I'm thinking about the wisdom that comes from listening more. There's going to be some verse that I can take into my day from Proverbs chapter one with regard to listening to people around me, being a better listener. Proverbs chapter two is about application. The second day of every month, I'm thinking about the wisdom that comes from applying what I know. Now, this has helped me get past knowing what to do and not having the wisdom or discipline to actually do what I know. BTW, by the way, when you do what you know, that is when God gives you another layer to know. Make time to be in the word daily. Now, I read the Old Testament and the New Testament and Proverbs. So number one, make time to read your Bible. Why? Faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. The daily bread of Jesus. The daily word coming into our lives. Number two, make time daily to make your requests known to God in prayer and then listen to his responses to you. Yes, God is still on speaking terms with his children. Yes, God is still on speaking terms with his children. He wants to speak to you daily. Daily provision for daily living. Listen, the problem you had yesterday and the problem that you will have tomorrow will be different than the problem you have today. And God wants to talk to you about the challenges you're facing right now. Maybe write down what you're hearing from the Holy Spirit and then test it against what God has already said in the Bible. Often when I'm praying, the bread I receive from the Lord is not just intended for me, but it's intended for someone else too. Regularly, I, I pick up my phone and I text how I am praying for that person because maybe they haven't made the time yet to get their bread from heaven. And my father knows that now, right now, they need something they have not come to him to acquire yet. So number one practice is take some time, make some time to read your Bible every day. Faith comes by hearing and hearing comes from the word of Christ. And number two, make time daily to make your requests known to God in prayer. Because prayer is how God spans the gap between heaven and earth. So here's a practical exercise to make this habit that you won't want to live without. Make time every day for the next 40 days. 
Divide that time in half. Now be practical about the time. Be practical, but also be purposeful in making time. Divide that time in half. Wait, nobody said there would be math involved, right? But here's how I do it in my life. And I wanted to share this experience with you. I like to sit at our dining room table right next to the kitchen for my daily bread. I have only seen bread made in the kitchen. And though I'm prone to eat bread while standing, I enjoy it much more while I'm at the dining room table. This is a positional thing for me and it's become my habit. When I'm at the table, I'm in a posture to actually partake. When I'm at my desk, I'm in a posture to work, my desk in my office. And I hear from my father at that desk, but the dining room is where I hear from me. And my desk is often where I receive bread for others. Set a time, set a timer and practice this. Now, you may need to modify this or change it up or move it up in time or move it down in time as your life changes. But remember this. Jesus said, Father, give us today, now, our daily bread, the daily provision you have already prepared for us. Devotional reading of the Bible, the word of God that is real bread for your soul and prayer recognizing who you are praying to first. Invest a few minutes in praise every day. Number one, acknowledge that he is good and his mercy endures forever. If you struggle with praise because you're, you're learning how or you just aren't sure about the language of praise, I remember when I first started praying, when I was a baby Christian, I didn't understand what it meant. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I didn't understand that set aside and sanctified, holy is your name. Amazing, above everything. is the power of your name. A, a pastor of ours, Pastor Jack K from we were in LA, he was so fluent in praise. He would just start to speak praise. And I, I was so, uh, I wanted that so badly. And the Holy Spirit started me in Psalm 121. If you're struggling to know how to praise, Grab Psalm 121 and 122 and 123. Open them up in your Bible or on your phone or your iPad or whatever you're using and walk around your house or sit at your table or stand in your kitchen and speak that out loud. Read it out loud from your heart. Begin with praise. Recognize who you're praying to first. Then make your requests known. But here's, here's what I want to op offer you this morning. Make the requests for you and others known and then be quiet and listen for as much time as you spoke. God knows what you need. He knows where you are and he knows who you are. Make as much time for listening as you did speaking. The next is, I believe that many times God wants to give us, he wants to give us the answer to our prayers by giving us direction right then, giving us understanding right then to fulfill the needs of that prayer. He doesn't want to wait. He wants to do it now. But if I don't stop and listen, I won't hear him. And I'll miss the bread that he's provided now. Then take that bread he's given you into your day and apply it to your needs in that day. Every day your needs may change. Patience versus tenacity. Mercy versus discipline. God is offering fresh bread for your life every day. Most of us like fresh bread when it's offered and not shoved in our face. Imagine the bakery owner coming to your table with a plate of freshly baked bread, warm and covered in melted butter. Offering it has a different vibe than walking up and shoving it in your face. God will not shove his bread in your face and tell you to eat. The prayer of provision is a daily encounter with the bakery of heaven 
where the owner is offering you fresh bread from his kitchen. Bread that will strengthen, encourage, and birth new growth for new healing and new life. This morning as I close, we're gonna partake in communion together. It is the first, it's the first Sunday of July and uh, we're here partaking together. We have bread and we have the juice today and uh, the bread representing the body of Jesus. Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. And of course, the juice representing the blood of Jesus that has been shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Now this morning, before we, we come to the communion uh, table, what I want to ask is, do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you surrendered your life to him to say, God, I believe in you. I believe that you are God because you rose from the dead. I receive your free forgiveness of sins. I surrender my life to you and I surrender the choices I have for the future into your hands. Have you said to Jesus, I am yours? Have you asked him today to fill you with his Holy Spirit? I wanna give you a moment just at home by yourself, uh, maybe there with family members. If you have not said yes to Jesus, today is the day. He has fresh bread for new life for you today. Today, he says, if you don't harden your heart, but you come to me, I will give you new life. The great exchange in Matthew chapter 11, where Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weak and heavy burden, and I will give you rest. He exchanges your burdens for his. Will you take a moment to pray this morning before we partake in communion to just say, Lord Jesus, I receive you. Forgive me for my sins. I receive your full forgiveness for my past sins. And I thank you that you have done the work of forgiving me on the cross. Lord, I thank you that today I get to surrender the burdens of my life at your feet. And today I receive the new life that you promise, the new grace that you promise, the new mercy that you promise me that will be new every morning. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may learn to love you more with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength and to love those around me the way you've loved me. If you've prayed that prayer and if you are a part of the family of God today, I wanna to invite you to the communion table. This is his table, by the way. Psalm 22 says he is prepared a table in the presence of our enemies. In the midst of the world, God has prepared a table, bread and blood, the juice, the wine of heaven, providing forgiveness for our sins. Today, as we partake, Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. When he took the bread, he broke it and he said, this is my body. Partake, and when you do, remember me. Go ahead and partake of the bread. And then Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Today, we remember that we are forgiven, that we receive new life from the bread of heaven, and that now, Jesus said, we are forever forgiven. Will you go ahead and partake of the cup? Will you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you that you have given us new life. We thank you that you have modeled prayer for us that Lord, today we commit before you to come daily for our bread of life, that you have something prepared for us before we ever wake up that's brand new, a new loaf of freshly baked bread to take into our hearts, to take into our day, 
that Lord will give us strength to meet the challenges of each day. Lord, we praise you and we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, that the blood of the lamb is now covering our homes and covering our hearts, covering our health. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over this coronavirus. And Lord, we thank you that the blood of Jesus is powerful to heal those who are sick this morning, to bring new life and to bring new forgiveness. And so, Father, we bless you and we thank you for your provision. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. We're going to be praying together on Thursday. Um, men, tomorrow night, we're doing men's group. Uh, if you have any needs or any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to email or call. Uh, we're here for you. We love you and we miss you desperately. We can't wait to, to actually gather together again. July 19th, we're having a picnic together. And uh, if you'd like more information, you can contact us through the website and we'll definitely get that information out to you. God bless you and have a blessed week.